but this is a topic that we could talk about for a month or more, uh, honestly. So we, I, I promise you we won't say everything that, that could or should be said even, but I want us to think deeply tonight. And so we're not going to just scratch the surface. We're going to actually dive into really the heart of this issue. And, and, and let me just say from, from the get-go, um, there are good and godly I was thinking good and gracious king. There are good and godly people on both sides of this discussion tonight. Um, within Orthodox Christianity, there are good and godly people who believe slightly differently about regeneration. For instance, um, she's still passing out paper. If you need paper, I have no handouts and no slides, okay? So raise your hand tonight, Laura, if you need something. Um, Brent, up here, turn around. We see that hand. Hands going up all over the auditorium tonight. Yes. Reminds me of those old Billy Graham crusades. The wind blows where it will, right? And that's part of the topic tonight, actually. The wind blowing where it wills. Not Billy Graham. Not Billy Graham, but, but that, that, that ideal from Scripture. John chapter 3 is really the key text tonight, but we'll be in several places as time allows. Uh, but to start, like we did last week, we're going to do a pop quiz, all right? And sadly, you're going to have to listen because... The questions aren't even up there. I completely forgot. I got distracted earlier and forgot to hit send. And so nothing went to that computer. Uh, technology's great, right, if you use it properly. Uh, it doesn't work so well when you forget to use it properly. So that's the place we find ourselves tonight. Um, I, in my studies, just the last, this is just from this week. Uh, let me just show you a few resources. Now, there are an infinite number almost of uh, of resources that you could look into pertaining to soteriology. I know I've shared a few with you in the past. I think uh, Robert P. Leitner does a great job of balancing some of the controversy within Christianity between Calvinism, Calvinistic thoughts, and Arminianism, Arminianistic thoughts, and really uh, what most people in the theological realm hate to consider is that there is any room for middle ground. Uh, I think that's um, a little arrogant to presume, it's a little presumptuous perhaps, um, some may call it moderate Calvinism today or uh, Amaraldianism. Uh, and again, if you want to press, I would fall into that Amaraldian camp um, concerning the atonement. I think a limited atonement is too limited. It's too narrow, uh, and it's usually wrongly defined. But Dr. Leitner does a great job of explaining that. He's got a number of books. Um, Corey, what's the other one? Brock, do you remember? The Death Christ Died. Yeah, that's it. The Death Christ Died. Uh, that's excellent. It's a sh smaller book. Um, this is a little more thorough. This takes uh, a look at Christ and our sin, like kind of from the beginning. So obviously it's a little more meaty. Sin, Savior, and Salvation. Um, this one, you're probably familiar with. This one's in our church library. Library, excuse me. Our library um, in junior high, apparently. Uh, Essential Truths of the Christian Faith, R.C. Sproul. Um, this is just uh, a book of... Um, definitions, basically, if you will, terms, terminology, definitions. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of good in this as well. And then this is a new book to me. Um, this is Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum. He is a Jewish Christian. He's not Messianic. Uh, he doesn't follow. I, I consider Messianic Judaism to be, uh, uh, how can I say this nicely, in its full expression of perversion of the gospel. Uh, there is no Jew, no Gentile any longer. We're one in Christ. Amen. And so, um, uh, he is a Christian. It's called the Soteriology of the Bible. This is laid out in an excellent fashion, excellent fashion. And uh, uh, if you want to take a look at this table of contents, I'd encourage you to do so. It defines a whole lot of things, but he deals with regeneration in here, which is what we're going to talk about tonight. It's really good. So, so those three, uh, these three works, I would say, uh, would be worth looking into. Uh, so let's do our quiz, okay? Y'all good with that? You ready? You have your thinking caps on? No, here's the first question. True or false? You ready? All Christians are born again. All Christians are born again. True or false? Huh? I didn't trick you? It's true. That, that, that one was... Uh, all right, true. That's true. All right, we, we all pretty much agree? All right, so again, all true Christians are born again. Second question. All who are truly born again are Christians. That's true. So you're thinking I'm, I'm tricking you somehow, I know, but that's true. I just reversed the order a little bit, right? Kind of reversed it. All right, pay attention. 
Rebirth is a necessary precondition to entering the kingdom of God. Rebirth is a necessary precondition to entering the kingdom of God. True? All right. Next, regeneration precedes faith. It is God's divine initiation into salvation. All right. And and I kind of misspoke anyway. Let me say it again. Regeneration precedes faith. It is God's divine initiative in salvation. Huh? Precedes faith. How many of you would say that's true? Okay. How many of you would say it's false? How many of you would say you're not sure? Okay. Okay, how many of you, Tyler, uh, would try to clarify the wording? I could see it in your face. How? That faith precedes regeneration? They mesh somehow, but we don't know how. How many of you would agree with that statement? All right. Those of you who are watching from home, let's tweet in those answers. And no, I'm just playing. All right. I mean, you can if you want to on the Facebook or something, but I was just kidding. All right. Okay, let's, let's not give a def- definitive answer for that yet. Let's move on. All right. And let me just say, no, no, let me hold off who said that. I'll tell you in a minute. So um, here's another one. Regeneration is not the fruit or result of faith. True or false? Regeneration is not the fruit or result of faith. True? T for true, okay. Okay, I, yeah, I was, I was waiting. I wanted to see how you're going to do that. You had to get in your YMCA poses. Okay, so, so, so regeneration is not the fruit or result of faith. Who says that's true? Who says that's false? And it's okay, we're, we're all family here. None of you are on the camera. Hey, zoom the camera around the No, I'm just playing. <laughs> So anybody say that's false? Anybody don't know? And that's okay. That's a good place to be. All right. You're in the right place tonight because we're going to make you real unsure of yourself before we're done. I mean, we're going to make you real certain about what the Scriptures say. All right. So um, here, here you go. Here's another fun one. Is salvation a process or an instantaneous act? It can't be both. That's illogical. Does not compute. Okay. Sanctification is absolutely a process, but we're not talking about that. So think about, think about salvation. Okay. All right. How many of you say that's true? How many of you say that's false? Well, that's your true, okay. You think it's false? I don't mean sanctification. If he works on our heart beforehand, it is a process. I would say your statement is true, but that's not what I'm saying. I'm simply saying, is salvation a process or an instantaneous act? Okay, let me word it another way. Is salvation a process or an instantaneous act that is simultaneous with faith? I'm watching team hand signals out here. Salvation is something that has and hasn't happened yet. Hey, watch this. I see what you're saying. You're speaking to the sanctification and our ultimate glorification in glory, maybe. Is that... Yeah, that's true. But is justification a process or is it an instantaneous act? So that, that's, that's the angle of salvation I'm getting at. So you're, you're not incorrect. But let me just say this. 
Already not yet. We live in the already not yet. Do you know how controversial that is in the Calvinistic camps? It's very, that's very, that's heatedly debated and strongly unbelieved in the Calvinistic camps. So I believe it though. Okay, okay, hold on. No one mentioned our perspective versus God's perspective. We're talking simple questions, okay? But, but it's got you thinking. That's what I want. That's right. Can y'all hear? Maybe we should pass this around for you, for, for you and Tyler and Brock, apparently. Um, so, I, I, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Hey, come, come get this. For real. Some, some, huh? Can you just repeat what we say? I can, I can try. Uh, but I think, I think we, have a, we have a lot of folks at home tonight. So I, I really think uh, this is why you should be here if you can, okay? But I know some people are, are unable tonight. Now, you've got to hold it up here where you can use it. Just to put it out here does absolutely nothing. It's nerve-wracking, so if you're afraid, just pass it on. <laughs> we are on the clock here. Time is money, and money is time, my brother. What am I saying? I don't know. I couldn't hear you. Uh, oh, I said, in our perspective, and then I'm looking at things from our perspective and God's perspective, and, and, and it seems that some of these questions are, in a Calvinistic view, and, and so the Calvinistic view is a, a, apparently uh, seeing things from God's perspective. But, you know, we're, we, are, we are human, and we have our perspective, right. and we have to see things from, in reality, in our perspective, and so there is two perspectives in, in reality. Okay. Even though he, he's already got the story told, we're living it. We're in that process of sure. salvation. He's got it already told. Yeah, yeah. I don't disagree with that. Um, but if our perspective differs from his, is it still right? And that's a trick question. I don't know if there's a good answer for that based on what you <laughs> said. All right, let's move on. Let's move on, all right? So, um, man must be, and I mean man generically, mankind must be born again to get to glory. How many of you say that's true? Uh, anybody think that's false? Okay. Um, all right, let me, let me repeat one of them I said earlier. Regeneration precedes faith. It is God's divine initiative in salvation. How many of you said that was true? Regeneration precedes faith. That is R.C. Sproul from this book. Okay. That is... Um, uh, 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 Page 179. Page 179. I'm going to leave this here, though, because I want to come back to that in just a moment. Now, regeneration is the work of the Holy Spirit. True or false? True. Regeneration is the work of the Holy Spirit upon those who are spiritually dead. True or false? True. True. That's true. The Spirit recreates the heart, quickening it from the dead. We go from spiritual death to spiritual life. True or false? True. And I want to just say a hearty, absolutely, amen, true. Okay? I like how that's worded. Both of those statements are from this book as well, from R.C. Sproul. Next, next statement. In regeneration, God plants a desire for himself in the human heart that otherwise would never be there. True or false? Anybody say false? Tyler, your face is all distorted. Explain what you mean in regards to this one. Where's the microphone? Thank you. So let me repeat the statement. In regeneration, God plants a desire for himself in the human heart that otherwise would not be there. And your comment or question or tweaking? Uh, I'll go with true. Okay. Yeah, I'll change my mind. All right. All right. Now, regeneration is not to be confused with the full experience of conversion. True or false? Regeneration is not to be confused with the full experience of conversion. And let me just clarify. By this, I do not mean sanctification. How many of you say it's true? Uh, 
Regeneration is not to be confused with the experience of conversion. Let's just say it that way. So from death to life. True or false? Maybe we just don't quite understand the whole regeneration. Okay. Say it again. As what? Conversion? I can't hear you, buddy. Get the microphone, please. I, I still don't understand what you're saying. Can you repeat the question? Yes, thank you. That's better. Regeneration is not to be confused with the experience of conversion. So how about this? Regeneration is not to be um, considered the full experience of conversion. Is that a better way to say it? That's a better way of saying it, yeah. Would you say that's true or false, since you have the microphone? I would say that's false. Okay. Would you yeah. care to say why? Uh, the conversion seems like it happens instantaneously, whereas the regeneration is still an ongoing process. Okay. All right. So next question follow-up question. Is regeneration the same thing as rebirth? Is to be born again the same thing as regeneration? Okay. So is regeneration a process? Okay, explain how it's a process. And we're all family here. Nobody's, nobody's, nobody's making fun of you. Casey, who lives on... No, I'm just <laughs> You need the microphone. Let me try to give you a little bit about my... Uh, no, my no, 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 okay. no. No. Just answer the question, please. Uh, so, re <laughs> is inter so regeneration, as I was going through uh, a, a life of being lied to and starting to hate the lie and beginning a, uh, a process in, in, in my perspective... Of, uh, uh, of me starting to love truth and seek truth, that was a process to me. Okay, so, is that the same as regeneration? Um, I, so perhaps the, the, the definition is of what I understand regeneration to be is, is this process of, uh, uh, of finding the truth of God. Okay, if that's your definition, I can't argue with you, but is that what regeneration is biblically? Um, I, I Let me did, ask it this way. Is regeneration and the efficacious call of God the same thing? But it's not a glossary <laughs> in, the, in the Bible. Uh, you're right. You look it up in the but, back. But these questions so. divide countries and congregations. They absolutely do. So I just want us to wrestle with them. That's all. Yeah. And I'm not trying to make enemies here, buddy. And again, we're family. We're all on the same team. But I think we should wrestle with with this a little bit. So when I when I hear the word, I'm thinking it's a, it's a process. Regeneration okay. sounds like a process. Okay, sure. and I understand that. But is regeneration and the efficacious call of God? When does God call us to salvation? Before the foundation of the earth. Okay, so is that regeneration? No. No, that's not the same thing. Okay, so just hold that thought. You, you need the microphone. You need the microphone, please. I can talk really loud. You sure can. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. We will define regeneration shortly. Yes, ma'am. But not yet. Not yet. Huh? Well, this, this makes us think. This makes us, this makes us dig in and question. And that's good to question. Not to question God, but to make sure our theology is sound. That we can stand, that we can stand when the questions come. Because they come. And they're, they're coming more and more from, from a lot of different camps. But um, R.C. Sproul says that regeneration is not to be confused with the full experience of conversion on page 180. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Good job. Hmm? No, I'll say, I'll say that. Is regeneration the, con is regeneration the what? Say it. Brent will say it. Regeneration is the root and conversion. Regeneration is the root and conversion is the fruit. What do y'all think? The process of repentance of sin after True or false? I think that's false. Uh, you're, 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 you're working. I get it. I get it. But I, I, I disagree with that. Regeneration. Uh, we have to be regenerated before we're converted. 
Regeneration is not sanctification. Yeah. It's not sanctification. Regeneration is not sanctification. John chapter 3 is about regeneration. If, if regeneration and rebirth are the same. Jesus, Which y'all all said it was. Exactly. And okay. Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. Amen. And compared it to physical birth. Physical birth isn't over a process over time. It happens instantaneously. Right. Pregnancy is a process. Physical birth happens instantaneously. Right? Well, 12 hours, but... The birth. Yeah, thank you. The birth. It's not, the birth. It's not a process that yeah. takes now years. Now, look, ladies, I know that we're men, okay? So we're humble men trying to make this analogy. I mean... But Jesus used this very analogy for, for a reason. It does for others. He used that analogy for a reason. Spiritual birth, he compares it to physical birth for a reason. All right? So to be born again is an instantaneous act of God. I don't believe spiritual birth is a process the way R.C. Sproul defines it. I would, I would adamantly disagree with his theology there. He's a brother and he'll be closer to Jesus than I am, I believe, in heaven. All right? But I think he misspeaks when he defines this this way. And we'll explain. But first, but first. I got a question, too. I mean, so we're saved by grace through faith yes. in Christ. Yes. But faith, faith does not come before rebirth? How can it not? That's a great question. That's a great question. Hold that question because we're going to wrestle with that in just a few minutes. Okay? Tyler, Chrisley, keep your son held down. All right? <laughs> Sydney, move a little closer to Tyler. Y'all stay on either side of him. That's a great question. And that's, we're getting to the heart of the problem in our, in our desire to, to articulate our theologies to such a degree, I think we misstep oftentimes in our defining of these terms. I think we go beyond the Scripture trying to be clear. And that's, I just want us to be clear, but scripturally clear, okay? So, A, a while ago, did, you, did y'all say that no, the effectual call is not linked to regeneration? We did not mention link. I ask, is the effectual call, does it equal regeneration? Okay, and that would be no, but I would say they're inseparably linked. All of the salvific process is inseparably linked. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. And it's all from God. We've already clarified that. Yeah, got it. It's all, it's all from God. So, yes. But I'm asking these things because we all think a little bit differently about some of the process and order of these things or even the definition. And, and I think by the time we're done, I think we'll be a little clearer, except for Meredith. She's mad she left. But I think the rest of us, I'm just playing. I'm just playing. Um, I'm going to get beat up now. Um, but I, I really think we'll come to understand where some of, the, some of the confusion lies and why there's so many camps in Christianity that are all within biblical Orthodox Christianity. That's what we're going to talk about. So here's my, here's my premise. And, and, and um, let, let me just say, I, think, I thought there was one more I missed. No, that's all of them. Um, here, here's, here's, here's my question. Is it not plausible that when we look at John chapter 3, that when we read this John 3 passage, which is where the, the doctrine of regeneration comes from, all right, born again, historically, biblical Christianity has relegated that discussion in John chapter 3 to the discussion of being born again, which equals, in Christianity, conversion slash salvation. Now, R.C. Sproul says it's just, uh, part of it. And, and that's where I would disagree with Sproul. All right. But um, is it not plausible that in the John 3 passage where Jesus tells Nicodemus in verse 16 that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life, could it not be that that is still in the discussion of regeneration itself? Not something that's separate, which is what much of Reformed theology has done. It's relegated belief to something outside of regeneration. But I don't think this text does that. And this is the text that's used in Calvinistic circles to build that argument. All right? What I want us to do is stop being Calvinistic versus Arminianistic. I want us to be biblical. And let's get past the Synod of Dort and let's get past the Westminster Confession that I truly believe, and this is just me, I believe they're too narrow in their definition of faith and regeneration. I think they try to, to articulate it to such a degree and the reasoning is, is all good, and the intent was fine because they were battling some heretical things. And so, so that's a good place where they come from. But I think they go too far 
and say something that the Scripture doesn't say. And here's part of the reason I say that. According to R.C. Sproul here and elsewhere in all of his teachings, he says that, that the order of salvation is this, and this is the typical Reformed ideal. Regeneration leads to faith, leads to justification, then sanctification, then glorification. Okay? My contention is that faith is part of what we call regeneration. And I think it has to be. Who said that? Yeah, okay, I, I agree. I think it has to be part of it because faith is every bit from God as grace is. Does that make sense? I think we go too far in trying to distinguish these things. And I've done it myself. I did it for years trying to go through. In fact, a couple years ago, we taught through all these big terms, and I don't like what I taught about regeneration. And so if you want to find it, it's there, but I may take it down and edit it soon. I think I went too far in separating out regeneration. Uh, I, 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 and I did it just because that's what I was taught in seminary, um, the typical Reformed view. But if, 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 if grace and faith come from God, if they're both gifts from God, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 tells us it is, amen? Then I think all of that is part of regeneration. For instance, if I could be regenerated before I believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, am I already saved? And if I'm already saved, why must I believe to begin with? Does that make sense? I don't think that question's really been wrestled with. At least not logically or or from the heart. Does that make sense? If God regenerates me so that I can have faith in Him, then I'm already a Christian, right? Because, again, according even to Reformed theology, to be regenerated is to be reborn. To be reborn is to be born again. To be born again is to be of God. Does that make sense? So faith and grace have to go together. Now, maybe, and again, that's from our perspective, I would say, for sure. And so if you want to separate God's perspective from ours, then in eternity past, we were already saved. So I, I get that argument. But I don't know that we should be worried about that argument. Does that make sense? I don't think that should be something that divides our churches, nor our, you know, church families placed around the world. I don't know that's something I would, it's definitely not something I would ever argue in public with yeah, is it a process or instantaneous, okay? I'm either saved or I'm not saved. Does that make sense? There's not a process of me becoming saved in that regard. I'm either born or I'm still in utero or somewhere along the way maybe, but that's still pre-birth, right? That's why the abortion industry makes those arguments. It's, it's either not born or born. Yes, being born, I know pregnancy is a process, but you're either born or you're not. Does that make sense? You're a human before you're born, obviously. That's where the argument may break down, right, Tyler? I'm looking at Tyler because, okay, okay, I thought he might, he might agree with me there. Oh, okay, okay, all right, all right. But to be born again means death to life, right? Is to be dead and then becoming, and then to be alive, is that a process? I'm either dead or I'm alive, right? How I become alive, logically, thinking, um, as God is, is moving upon me, I can agree with what Casey said that my coming to faith may be a process. But when I come to faith, I'm born again, right? I was not a Christian before I came to faith. Does that make sense? And, and so that's the rub between a lot of these schools of thought. So... I think we make much ado about nothing, personally. I think we're either saved or we're not, right? So, let's talk about that, unless you had something. You have the mic, I think. No, I, I was just going to say our realization of it is a process, I believe. Yeah, and that's good. That, and that's what I Casey's think that's saying, what he's trying to say. We're saved sense? at a point, a moment in time, and we may not even realize what's taken place and taken hold of us, but... I know for me, I don't remember the day or the hour or anything like that that I was saved, but I recognized that something had changed and I'm walking differently, yeah. talking differently, and, and there's things that just fell off of me. It right. was my realization of those things that causes me to look back and say, whoa, something, something has happened to me. Yeah, that's, that's fair. I mean, I, I would agree with that. And, I, and that's, 
If that's what you mean, I'm wholeheartedly with you. In my perspective, I can get behind that being my perspective, what you're saying. But that doesn't mean that salvation's a process. I don't think that's the same thing. No, it's not. It's absolutely not. And you're my brother. You're my brother. Now, Tyler's mad at you, but I am not, Casey. I'm just playing. I don't know why I pick on Tyler every Wednesday night. Go ahead, Tyler. You have Uh, the floor. This kind of goes back to where I would said that they mesh, and you were kind of talking about how they're inseparable. Regeneration means we're coming from a stony heart to a heart of flesh, Mm -hmm. right? Right. So what gives us a heart of flesh? Because that means being saved. Well, Philippians 3.9 says that it's through faith that we now are righteous. Mm -hmm. So our faith regenerates us, but you must have a regenerated heart to believe. This is what I mean when I say they mesh somewhere in the middle, but we, and, and, it doesn't spell it out for us. And I think that's a fair thing to say, a fair way to, to word it. Um, there's still some mystery there, so I would agree with you. Yeah, I have no comment. Does that make sense? So, so let's look at John 3. I don't think we have much time left. Oh, my goodness. Did we start, like, really late? Because I didn't ask 40 minutes of questions, did I? Okay. Let's look at John 3. In fact, let's read through it. And if you want to say something or you have a question, raise your hand. Let's read through John 3. This is the rebirth chapter. And I, and I was telling several of you, this could be a three- or four-week discussion, just this part. But I think next week, when Brock gets up and looks at repentance, I think some of these things that we've been saying beforehand will come together. Brock's going to teach next week. So it'll be a lot clearer and less muddy. (laughs) So now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. So if Nicodemus is a ruler of the Jews, this is pre-church, obviously. This is pre-Pentecost. There are no Christians yet. Let's just make sure we're understanding that, right? There's no Christians yet. But the language of regeneration is very important here. So let's listen. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, and no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. That's a nice platitude to start the ball rolling. And Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And we all said true to that earlier. Amen? You have to be born again to see the kingdom of God. So I love this story. I know we've talked about this before, but I'm going to say it again. Jesus cut right to the heart of the matter. He didn't go into platitudes. He didn't get into semantics. He just spoke the clear truth that you have to be born again to go to heaven. Amen? So Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Now, Nicodemus, true or false, is talking about physical birth right there as an example. That's true. He's talking about physical birth. So let's keep reading. Jesus answered in verse 5, Truly, uh, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Now, here's my question. Is verse 5, being born of water, the same thing as being born of the flesh? Some people say it is. I don't think that they're right. I don't think it's the same thing. Being born of water and born of the Spirit are speaking of the same thing. Those are Old Testament passages that are being referred to. We'll come back to those if you'll just write down, same thing, question mark, if you're taking notes. But that which is born of the flesh is flesh. Now Jesus talks about physical and spiritual. That which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it but you don't know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. So that means that you're born of what? Born of the Spirit is being born of God. All right? And we don't know. I mean, God, God's Spirit moves where He wants to move, right? Not it. He moves where He wants to move. And so the point there being what? Summarize. It's of God's will. It's of God's will. Thank you. That's it. Now, look at, look at 9. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? And rightly so. I mean, his, his whole religious upbringing is being undermined right here. All the works-based theology of Judaism is being swept under the rug. And so he, he says, how can these things be? Jesus answered him and said to him, are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? So this is a Paul Washer moment. 
for Jesus, okay? I'm just, you know, roses are red, violets are blue, repent. That's a Valentine's for him, Paul Washer. There you go. But that's what Jesus is doing. Jesus is just saying, surely you jest, right? You're the teacher. You should know this. Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen. And you do not accept our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses, and this is key, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. The serpent incident, you remember that from the wanderings, um, Numbers 21, is that right? I think that's, isn't that Numbers 21? Anybody have little things out? Beside? Yeah, Numbers 21, verses 4 through 9, right? All right, thank you. My brain, my brain worked for a minute there. All right, so what happened in that story? Do you remember? They're, they're dying. Moses crafted a snake, put it on the pole, held it up, right? That's PJ's ancestor, by the way, you know, putting stuff on a stick and frying it up. Oh, no, 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 sorry. Uh, that's his Cajun roots. But, but he put it on the stick, and so everyone who looked at the pole were what? They were healed. Everyone who looked or refused to look at the pole were what? They were dead. They were not healed, right? So did the pole in and of itself atone for the sickness of those people? Faith had to be exercised by looking right? The sacrifice was given, and only those who looked and believed. I mean, that's the deal. They're obeying. They had to look at it to receive the benefit. True or false? That's true. That's true. That's the analogy Jesus makes now with the cross. This is why I believe a limited atonement is too limited. It's too limited. I think this is a good proof text here for it. So he says, so that whoever believes in him, verse 15, will have eternal life. Oh, did I skip something? No, no, that's it. Now, verse 16, right behind that, he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So, Jesus on the pole, like the serpent fashioned on the pole. Does the, does the Jesus on the cross save everyone by the fact that he's on the cross? What must people do with Jesus on the cross in order to be saved? Believe. Just like... In the wilderness, the Jews had to look to the serpent on the stake to be saved, right? So faith had to be exercised. So in so far, let's stop right here, but so far, before anyone believes upon Jesus on the cross, are they regenerated? And I know this is controversial. But I can't see how anybody could be regenerated and have new life before they believe upon Jesus on the cross. Does that make sense? This is where I think our, our, our Calvinistic theologies, and this would be more on that extreme side, right? What's the norm now today, I would say, in our country, for sure. I think this is where we, we have erred theologically. We've tried to divide these things too much. It sounds smart. We sound great, right, when we're saying it. But we actually wind up not making any biblical sense, I think. This is me, and everyone, I know I'm going to get hate replies for saying this. But I don't see how we can be regenerated before we believe. This whole chapter is regeneration. I, I can't answer where Sproul and others do. But Sproul was real big on the Ordus, uh, how do you say it in Latin? Salutis. The Ordus Salutis. Real big. Um, a lot of the, and that's more of the Presbyterian reform side. All right. Remember, R.C. Sproul was Presbyterian. Um, but that order, is, that order is not taught in Scripture the way they proceed. And, and I don't think they're, they're heretics. I'm not saying that they're lost. I'm saying perhaps we go too far in trying to explain our theologies, put it in order. I, I think it's, it's simple enough. Am I saved by grace through faith in Jesus? Then, then who cares what the order is? Does that make sense? Grace through faith. Okay, I'll give you that order. That, that one works. I think that's what you just said. All right? But I'm not saved. Grace itself doesn't save me. 
It's grace applied through faith that saves me. True or false? So I'm not saved just by grace. God has a grace, a common grace. I agree. And that's a good, good reform teaching there. I agree there's a, there's, a, there's a common grace that goes out. The fact that we all woke up today is common grace. The fact that we're saved is a efficacious grace. It's a little different. It's more specific. You gotta, you gotta use the mic, buddy. I think so, yeah. Can the unborn exercise faith? Huh? Can the just born, newly born, whatever we were saying a while ago, exercise faith? They can't. So, so that is of grace of God. I think John MacArthur's work called um, Safe in the Arms of Jesus, I think he does a fantastic job of describing how that grace is applied. And, and, and that's above my pay grade. I'm just, I'm just gonna say, I know that, da that King David said before the cross, that he would see his son. Yeah, I'm not arguing at all, but I, how it plays out, I can't, that's above my pay grade, buddy. I, I, can't, I can't argue how it plays out when they can't exercise their faith. Okay, I, I have some ideas, but they're irrelevant, honestly. I, I can't scripturally make a case for that, but I know it's true. I can't tell you why I know it's true, but that's the heart of our God. They cannot believe. So I think, I think, I think there is grace there. Um, Everybody has Romans 1 grace. So let's talk about that another time. I, I, I just, something just, I just had an epiphany. Maybe it'll help, but that's for another time. Is that okay? All right, so how much time do we have left? None. Um, let's keep reading. I'm so sorry. Let's keep reading. Amen. For God did not send his son in the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. We've barely scratched the surface of regeneration, y'all. I'm sorry. He who believes in him is not judged. This is important. He who does not believe in him has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Do you see that? I, we believe we're saved. We don't believe we're not saved. Belief is part of it. In God's economy, efficacious calling, uh, all of that stuff works. Yes, I get it. I can see somewhat of an order with that. But I, the, the grace does not save me apart from the faith. It doesn't. Or else the scriptures are wrong. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. All of us loved darkness before we were saved, right? And how are we saved? By grace, through faith in Jesus Christ. To the glory of God, right? And we can say it like the reformers did. And, and I'll give a hearty amen of approval here. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, for the glory of God alone, according to the Scripture alone. We don't add, we don't take away. But I think when we so intently seek to define these terms in our soteriology and then put them in some kind of logical order, I think we get very dangerously close to undermining the whole thing. And I, I just don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. It's enough to, to take the scripture how it says. So, so what, what is then regeneration? Let me just give you a couple of, uh, of things. And, and, and folks, I, I got a whole outline here. I, I think I'll share this on, on the website here uh, tomorrow, okay, on the way to, um, on the way to Marble Falls. Um, but there's, there's, I mean, I, I just think this is great. This is from Titus 3.5. Turn to Titus 3.5 very quickly. W will you allow me just a few more moments? I mean, honestly, I've only been talking for 45 minutes, but I should have been able to say it all in 30. <laughs> I'm so sorry. What did I say, Titus? You turn to Titus 3.5. Titus 3.5. Mr. Wayne, I love you out there and the rest of you who are watching from home. I know this is stirring up great questions and discussion. He's going, why did you call my name out? I'm sorry. I, just, I don't know why I did. <laughs> I don't know why I did. All right, look at verse 5. This is just gold. Because it's scripture. It's gold. It's gold, Jerry. It's gold. Here we go. He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. So whose work is that? God's. That's right. Who said that? Miss Judy. It's, God, it's Christ alone's work. Amen? 
Now, it's the work of God. We're saved by grace through faith in Christ. So the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. I really think those two things are saying the exact same thing. I'll give you, um, uh, in our blog on the website, I'll give you those Old Testament passages where those two things are equated. All right? Those two things are equated. Um, but that is a work of God. That is a work of God. Um, uh, Ryrie says this, personal salvation is not achieved through good deeds, but through the cleansing of the new birth. Rebirth, regeneration, conversion. Okay? It, are those things the same? I think they are. I don't think I'm saved before my faith is placed in Jesus. If I'm regenerated before I believe, then what is the point of my having to believe? Does that make sense? Maybe that's too simplistic. You got something? Well, I, it, I think I told you the analogy that Stephen Lawson used with the campfire, right? Heat and light exist simultaneously. You don't get heat first, then the light, or light first, then the heat. So you have these things that they're not separated. They can't be because we need a work of God on our hearts to have a saving faith. But saving faith is what works our heart to a fleshy heart. They exist simultaneously, not side by side, together. Yeah. What do y'all think about that? True or false? <laughs> true. I think that's true too. Yeah, no, Brock's going to add. Well, no. It, or, it kind of just adds to what he's saying. It has to be this way. It, it has to be because then you have passages that say that which is of the flesh cannot please God. So how do, how do you come, how, how do you bridge that gap? Say it again. That which is of the flesh cannot please God, right? From yeah. first, I believe, oh, was that Romans 8? Well, and, and then... You know, all the other things, John, John, I know. John chapter 6. All the other places we wrestle with. <laughs> all the other places that we wrestle with, right? So it has to, at the very least, it has to be instantaneous, the, the, the regeneration and the faith. I agree. Sa same exact time. It has or to be instantaneous. Yeah. It has yes. to. Yeah. It has it, to. It's not faith leading to regeneration, and it's, and not, it's regeneration not regeneration leading to, leading to faith. And that's the historic Reformed theology. Yeah. That's not necessarily Calvinism because Calvin didn't say it so, so definitively. Right. I think John Calvin wrestled with it, and that's very clear. He was dogmatic in the Institutes in his 20s, and he was, as an el older man, I say elderly, he was in his 40s and 50s, uh, yeah. he was completely different in his, in his commentaries over the Gospel of John, and this chapter in particular, John chapter 3. So um, is there a divine spark that initiates it? Sure, otherwise we would get credit, right? But we have to believe, and, and we're not regenerated until we believe. And it's not a process of regeneration that leads us up to belief. It, it, it can't be. They have to be instantaneous. And, that, and that's why I said I, dis, I disagreed with what uh, Sproul said in this book. In this book. I like, I'm telling you, I, the more I read Leitner, the more I appreciate his wrestling with Scripture. Um, again, he would be... Uh, they would throw him into the uh, four-pointer camp, and a lot of the five-point or more, there's seven- to nine-pointers, a lot of those uber-reformed, Cal hyper-Calvinistic guys uh, who are very popular today uh, would say that this is a compromise that doesn't exist in the Scripture. I just disagree with them. I, I, I think they're too smart for their own britches, personally. I, I want to stick with what Scripture says. And I'm not saying that to be mean at, at all, really not. But I think they go beyond what the Scripture says. I think there's a mystery that we can't explain it so precisely the way they do. I think it's enough to say that we have to believe upon Jesus and be saved. Amen? And we're saved by grace through faith in Jesus alone, as Miss Judy said a while ago. Amen? But to begin to put an order to these things, I think is very dangerous. You're going to say something? Because I want to define regeneration let me define regeneration. Did I misspeak there? Did I say anything bad? Did I say... I 
I don't know that, Casey. You're smarter than me. I, I, I mean that. I, I don't know that answer. But here, what is regeneration according to the Bible? Let me give you a couple definitions, and then we'll say goodbye for tonight. We'll say until next time, all right? But there's plenty more to discuss here, obviously. Obviously. So what is regeneration? Another word for regeneration is rebirth, related to the biblical phrase to be born again from John chapter 3. Our rebirth is distinguished from our first birth when we were conceived physically and inherited our sin nature. The new birth is a spiritual, holy, and heavenly birth that results in our being made alive spiritually. Man in his natural state is dead in his trespasses and sins until he is made alive or regenerated. That's one. Um, I think that's gotquestions.org, actually. Let me give you a couple others here. Um, regeneration is the work of the Holy Spirit in giving life to the believing sinner affecting the new birth. The word regeneration, and this is important to, to jot down, the word regeneration is used two times in Scripture. Matthew 19, 28, nothing to do with salvation. It has to do with um, the regeneration of all things, and that's going after the tribulation into the millennial reign of Christ and beyond. And then Titus 3, 5, which is clearly salvific. That's the only two words only two uses of that word regeneration. But the concept and the teaching of regeneration finds its defining in John chapter 3. Born again, new birth. The root is uh, in a Greek word from which is the same root as to be regenerated in Genesis 3, 5. And that word is, is a Christopher Walken word. It's, you know, I can't do it, but I wish Gavin was here. Uh, guys, you know. You know, no, it's like, you know, almost, but it's, there's a G in the beginning. So that's as good as I knew. That was horrible. I'm embarrassed. I'm getting hot. I think I'm uh, red now. But that word is the root of those passages, to be born again and to be regenerated in Titus 3, 5. And so being born again includes the ideal of regeneration. Regeneration then does not precede faith, but occurs simultaneously, instantaneously. I think that's the biblical position. Yeah, this, after the Synod of Dort is where you begin to see the Ordu Salutis, the order of salvation. There was an attempt, and again, from a good heart, they wanted to distinguish between our working for our salvation. I think the heart was right, the intent was right. I think the order was too far. I think they went too far in the order. They were simply trying to say that we don't add to our salvation in any form. And I think we could say it that simply. Amen? We don't add to our sal salvation. Our faith itself is a gift from God. So, um, does it start with God? Yeah. Efficacious call, that starts with God. Could it be that that is what bring, brought Casey to begin to seek? It's the efficacious call in eternity past that brought him to a place where he was regenerated. Does that make sense? And have I lost y'all? Y'all are all looking tired now. I'm sorry. I know I just keep rambling. Conviction. Yeah. Yeah. Leading up to gener regeneration. Okay, I'm with you. I would agree with that. I think that makes sense biblically. Yeah, but regeneration itself, I don't think we should say it's a process. I think we're on some shaky ground. I think that's shaky ground. Now, again, when we get to heaven, maybe we'll say, okay, we'll talk with R.C. Sproul and try to figure out what he was saying. I don't think I'll care when I get to heaven. Honestly, I think it'll be okay. Does that make sense? What, regeneration? How it's used? Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Uh, I, I don't remember the tense, but there's no difference because it's only used two times. Um, let me sign off. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll pick up on this, I promise. I'll try to make some uh, um, uh, recordings for some more of this stuff. And then uh, I'll definitely put these things onto the website or probably tomorrow. I don't know if I'll get to it tonight. Um, let me pull up that word real quick so I don't lie to you. Uh, any other question or thoughts?